Just to reiterate what we just saw in this simple simulation, we had a population that was normally distributed with a mean of 100 and a standard deviation of 15. We had a formula column that took a mean of two random draws from this population, took the average, and plotted that on a histogram. Here was the resulting distribution of n equals 2. This is actually the identical distribution we found when we did it in the other simulation. That is, when we had observation 1 and 2 as separate columns and then took a mean. The reason I showed it to you this way is to give you the insight about why it is unlikely to get very extreme values. It's simply a very rare sampling event. Alright, so that's samples of size 2. Let's see what happens when we add samples of size 4, 16, and 64. Now I want to draw your attention first to the mean of these distributions. The mean of each of these sampling distributions, that is the mean of all the means we took at random, is 100. That is, the population mean, which is 100, is the same as the sampling distribution mean. This is the first and critical property of a sampling distribution. The sampling distribution of the mean always has the mean equal to the population mean. This is the unbiasedness of the sample mean estimator. That is, we expect, on average, over all the samples we can take from a population, that the sample means will average out to be the population mean. We actually saw this very clearly with that full sampling distribution, where we saw that the mean of the sampling distribution with n equals 2 was exactly equal to the population mean. In fact, it had to be. The sampling distribution with samples of size 2 had every observation that was in the population. Each observation happened 10 times, but just because we had each observation 10 times doesn't change the mean. So notice that the sampling distribution of the mean will always have the population mean. That is true unequivocally. Next, you probably notice that these distributions are being drawn in. I've made mention of this several times. It is simply less likely to get extreme sample means when we have larger samples. This is the consistency of the statistic. If we look at the standard deviations on the side, we started out with a population standard deviation of 15, but then with samples of size 2, the standard deviation of the sampling distribution was 10.6. With samples of size 4, the standard deviation of that sampling distribution was 7.5, down to 3.7 with samples of size 16, and down to 1.9 with samples of size 64. So, this is our second very important property of sampling distributions. As the sample size increases, the standard deviation of the sampling distribution decreases. And here's something specific. It decreases by the square root of the sample size. Now this property is rather critical, and we're going to talk pretty often about the standard deviation of the sampling distribution. We'll talk about it so much that it's simply going to become inconvenient to say the standard deviation of the sampling distribution of sample means. Imagine me saying this in every lecture. It would simply become annoying. Now it's annoying to statisticians, so we have a different name for this, the standard deviation of the sampling distribution of sample means. We simply call this the standard error. Now the standard error, or the standard sampling error, is simply the standard deviation of a sampling distribution of sample means. Don't let the fact that we have a new term for it make it any less clear. This is just how spread out a sampling distribution is. But now we're talking about how spread out sample means are from the population mean. So the standard error is a quantity we really care about. This is the standard amount of sampling error we expect to get. And notice if the standard error is smaller, then we expect our sample mean to be closer to the population mean. If we have a very large standard error, that means we don't expect our sample mean to be close to the population mean. Now the standard error has its own symbol. It's sigma with the subscript x bar. This is actually a general notation for sampling distributions. It's simply sigma with the subscript of the symbol of the statistic we're using. So sigma sub x bar literally reads as the standard deviation of the sampling distribution of the sample mean. Now, I already told you the formula for this. Sigma sub x bar is simply the population standard deviation divided by the square root of n. It will also be useful for us to write it as the square root of the population variance over the sample size. These are completely identical. Remember, a population variance, or a variance in general, is just the square of the standard deviation. 
So all we've done is write this a little bit differently. But when we start talking about variances more often, it'll be more useful for us to think of the standard error as the square root of the variance in the population divided by the sample size. But for now, let's not forget what this means. The standard error decreasing is telling us something about the likelihood of getting certain sample means. That is, when we look at the standard errors, let me actually add in the correct notation, we can see that with samples of size 64 from this population, we're expecting only about 1.9 units, remember these are IQ units, of standard error. That is, it would be pretty unlikely for us to get a sample mean that's 10 away from 100. So, the standard error is perhaps the most critical quantity we need to know about because it tells us the likelihood of getting extreme sample means. Finally, we notice that the sampling distribution was normally distributed. That is, every single one of the sampling distributions from a normal population was normally distributed. The scaling may throw you off here, but I promise you, every single one of these distributions is normally distributed, even when we had samples of size 2. Remember, going back, if we had samples of size 1 from a normally distributed population, we simply recreated the population. So even samples of size 1 from a normally distributed population will be normally distributed. But again, we need to know under what conditions. Under what conditions will the sampling distribution of the mean be normal? We know it's normal if the population is normal, but we also know it isn't normal for some situations. Remember when we took samples from a random binomial, that is, we took samples of size 1, we certainly did not observe normally distributed error. Even when we took samples of size 4, we didn't observe normally distributed error. But when we took samples of size 100 from those little boxes, the random binomial, we did observe normally distributed error. And if we look at the sampling distribution for the three populations, we're actually going to be able to see what it is about sample size that yields the normal distribution. Let's try it with one of the different populations, one of the non-normal populations. Let's start with the uniform. Here is the uniform population you'll find in that data set. It still has a mean of 100 and a standard deviation of 15, but notice that the population does not have a normal distribution. When we take samples of size 2, we get that somewhat familiar triangular shape. This is not normally distributed. This distribution still has a mean of 100 and a standard error that's smaller than the population standard deviation, but the shape of this distribution is not normal. When we take samples of size 4, something is already happening. Notice that a familiar shape is starting to appear. We're getting a little bit of roundness to this distribution. By the time we get up to samples of size 16, it's almost looking normally distributed. And by the time we get to samples of size 64, this distribution is actually indistinguishable, almost, from a normal population. Again, look at the mean of each of these sampling distributions. Regardless of the shape of the population, the mean of a sampling distribution of means will always have the population mean. This is unequivocally true. No matter what the population shape, the sample mean is an unbiased estimator of the population. That is to say, the mean of a sampling distribution of means will have the population mean of mu. Next, notice that the distributions are being drawn in like we saw before. And in fact, the standard errors here we could calculate using the formula that I gave you, the population standard deviation divided by the square root of n. In fact, because the population started off with the same standard deviation as the normal population, these standard errors are actually identical. That part doesn't change. What's critical here is that the distributional shape is changing. We're changing from that flat population, and through the sampling process, we end up with what is a normally distributed sample mean. And this is an incredible property of nature. Let's try one more population, that very skewed beta population. This has a different mean, a mean of 0.94 and a standard deviation of 0.05. Let's take samples of size 2. Right away, you can see something's happening here, certainly not normally distributed, but we're drawing in the tails and rounding it out. With samples of size 4, the distribution has been pulled in quite a bit, and with samples of size 16 and 64, we're getting much closer to a normal distribution. Even with samples of size 64, we don't have a perfectly normal distribution, but clearly there's some latent shape in nature that's evincing itself through our sampling process.
Now again, the mean of each of these sampling distributions is exactly equal to the population. Again, this is an unequivocal property of sampling distributions. They will have the mean of the population. Next, these distributions are being drawn in. Again, this reflects the calculation of our standard error. And in fact, calculating these standard errors, we can do with the exact same formula, sigma of the population divided by the square root of the sample size. But again, the shape here is the critical point to pay attention to. With small samples from a non-normal population, we will not have a normally distributed sampling distribution. I'll say that again. With small sample sizes from a non-normally distributed population, we will not have a normally distributed sampling distribution. We need very large samples when we have a non-normal population to ensure, or at least to assert, that the sampling distribution of the mean will have the normal shape. And so going back to our characteristics, the sampling distribution is normally distributed under certain conditions. The conditions are when the population is normal, which means that every sampling distribution, no matter what the size, will be normal, or when samples are large. Now a good rule of thumb is having a sample size greater than about 30, but notice that that is not always the case. When we had a very skewed population, sometimes it takes larger sample sizes than that. But this is a rule that people typically use. When we have a non-normal population and sample sizes above about 30, we can be relatively sure that the sampling distribution of the mean is normally distributed.